Welcome everybody. Today's chapter is called Micaiah and King Ahab. The second story is also about a prophet who faced up to King Ahab. The scene is set in Samaria, the capital of the Northern Kingdom. And on the day in question, the king was in high spirits. His neighbour and ally, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, was paying a state visit. And Ahab had every reason to think that the political talks that they'd been having over the last few days were going the way that he wanted. It had been a long-standing grievance and a blow to national pride that the old desert fortress of Ramoth Gilead was in enemy hands. This ancient Israelite town was occupied by the Syrians and for prestige reasons, if for nothing else, Ahab felt that now was the time to get it back. Jehoshaphat was sympathetic and pledged to help. To gain moral support for their action, the two kings took their, the advice of the court prophets, 400 of them, and with one accord the prophets urged them on to battle and promised them success. Yet something about these religious yes-men made Jehoshaphat uneasy. Were they saying what they believed or what they knew the kings wanted to hear? So Jehoshaphat asked if there were no other prophets in the place who might be consulted. This put Ahab in a fix. There was indeed one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, not one of the regular court prophets, but a man of independent judgment who spoke his mind without fear or favour. Ahab had good cause to hate him, for every time he'd asked his views, the verdict had always been opposite of what the king wanted to hear. Micaiah had paid for his boldness, and was at that very moment in the palace dungeon. However, Jehoshaphat insisted that Micaiah's voice be heard, so an officer was sent to fetch the troublesome prophet from the jail. Meantime, there was a splendid performance for the, for the visiting king's benefit. The two monarchs sat on their thrones at the city gates, arrayed in their royal robes, while the 400 court prophets processed in front of them vying with each other to shout the loudest that victory was as good as won and that God was on their side. One of them donned a pair of iron horns and thrust right and left like a bull to show how the enemy would be routed. While all this was going on, Micaiah was being given advice by his escort. Take your cue from the rest of the prophets. They've all foretold success and victory, so don't spoil the king's day. Micaiah's grim reply was that he would say what the Lord told him to say, no more and no less, whether it pleased the king or not. So Micaiah was brought before the two monarchs, the bedraggled, emaciated prisoner confronting the regal splendour of Israel and Judah. At first, when Ahab asked him, should we embark on this enterprise or stay where we are? Micaiah, with biting irony, replied, by all means, on to victory. The Lord is on your side. He might have added, your 400 godly advisers have told you to go on and win, so who am I to contradict them? Then Ahab, dominated by his forceful wife Jezebel, but still with far more respect for this awkward prophet of the God of his fathers than for the 400 paid lickspittles of his court retinue, said to Micaiah, how many times must I charge you on your solemn oath to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Ahab knew that from this one man and from him alone he would get the truth. And every time he got an answer, it was an answer that he didn't want to hear. He hated Micaiah for it. But in his heart of hearts, he knew that this was a man of God who would speak as God prompted him. So on this occasion too he demanded the truth, knowing that he would get it, and already hating what he was certain he would hear. For Ahab knew in the secret of his soul that he'd been a failure as a king of Israel. He'd betrayed the faith of Abraham, of Moses and of David. He had used his power for his own advancement and not for the good of his people. How on this expedition, which was meant to further nothing but his own prestige, could he expect blessing and victory from the God he had spurned? He knew Micaiah's answer 
before it came. Then the floodgates were opened, and this man of God said what was given him to say. Who can tell what went into a prophet's vision? Micaiah said that he saw Israel scattered on the mountain, a sheep without a shepherd. It meant disaster for the expedition and death for Israel's king. Perhaps he saw things with an insight and a perception that were denied to ordinary folk. Perhaps what he said was based on his appraisal of the political situation and his estimate of Israel's chances. Who knows? What we do know is that however he came to that assessment of the result of the assault on Ramoth Gilead, he had the courage to say so to the king, knowing full well that his honesty would send him back to jail. Ahab's reaction was prompt and decisive. Take this man back to the dungeon and keep him on bread and water until I return victorious. Micaiah's wry comment may have gone unnoticed. If you return victorious, God has not spoken through me. But Ahab was not to be deterred. The armies marched on Ramoth Gilead and were completely routed. Ahab paid enough heed to the prophet's warning to disguise himself as a common soldier. But even that couldn't save him, and he fell mortally wounded by an arrow from an unknown bowman. Before the day was over, his body was brought back to the capital for burial. And what of Micaiah? With Ahab dead and his army defeated, Micaiah must either have been put to death or died of starvation. But he stands out in the story as a man who was ready to face death rather than compromise with his conscience. Micaiah obeyed a higher law than the law of self-preservation. He had committed his life to God and his supreme loyalty was to the God who had called him. With heart and mind and all his senses, he was ready to receive the messages that God sent him. And what God said to him was truth that must be told, whatever the occasion, whatever the consequences. What Micaiah was showing, like Moses, like Nathan, like Elijah, and after his day, like Amos, Isaiah and the rest of these Old Testament prophets, was that things do not happen by chance. The Lord God is in control of all that happens. There is a supreme power in charge of life and history. Ahab was on any normal showing a reasonably competent, efficient king. But as the sovereign of the people of God, the people of the covenant, the people of the Ten Commandments, he was a failure. And Micaiah was not afraid to say so. We cannot see the story of Ahab's downfall isolated from his past. In a sense, he was a pathetic figure. But this was the man who had weakly submitted to Jezebel's ambition to substitute her own brand of paganism for the historic faith of Israel. This was the man who had allowed his queen to murder Naboth, a peasant who had insisted on his right to independence. From Micaiah's point of view, the king was a failure and the Lord God had no further use for him. Surely what emerges from the story is that when a man lives close to God, as Micaiah did, and listens to what God says to him, he has no choice but to speak the truth as he sees it, even if it brings him disaster or even death.